What up? Good morning. It's Saturday. What's today's date? I think it's like the the I don't know. I know it's about eight o'clock. And uh me and my wife, we're going to uh a first time home buyers class. So we about to go ahead. We we right now we are picking up our aunts to go along with us because they wanted to go. It's at one of my aunt's churches. She told us about it. Um so we're gonna go ahead. My aunt's about to get in the car. And then um yeah, I'm gonna see if I can if they allow me to record the first time home buyers class for anybody who might, you know, be interested in that type of thing. Um, you know, who don't know how to buy homes or thinking they might want to buy a home anything you know stuff like that <laughs> but uh for anybody wanting to you know maybe look into buying their own home who don't really uh have that much knowledge you don't have, or don't you uh yeah. <laughs> don't have the resources i'd say i uh, can what's the name of your church church of christian compassion and what class we going to? Um, rebuilding. Rebuilding. Yeah. Getting your house going. Getting your house in order. Okay. Getting your house in order. First time home buyers. Credit rebuilding. Flipping homes. Invest how to invest. I can't say they got a bank coming out here. That's who's doing Fulton the classes. Bank. You said Fulton? Fulton Bank. Fulton Bank. And doing our classes. Spending your money, so you can say, you know what? I spent six hundred dollars on Chipotle this month. Maybe 
Maybe there's food in the fridge like my mom has always been telling me, right? That extra $20 that we spend on lunch each day works out to be $100 a week. That works out to be $400 a month. That's a car payment, right? That is a car payment. So savings is something that, it can be something as small as putting aside $20 a week. Right? Putting something small aside $20 a week, then in, in 10 years, right, they're going to be getting ready to go to college. Right? So putting aside whether it's $10 a week, $20 a week, $100 a week, whatever you can, you want to make sure that you plan for that effectively and save for those four or five expenses that the lead will take to fill for $20. Yeah, I've tried those things still put $20 aside because if you're able to put little by little, it's going to add up. Right, it's going to add, add up, and then you have compounding interest where that money's going to grow and grow and grow more and more and more as time goes on. I think the, the biggest thing when it comes about saving is we automatically look at it and we say, wow, saving is a very difficult. But the most important part about savings is actually starting. Because if you put a dollar, if you put away a dollar today, and you put another dollar away tomorrow, then you have two dollars. But if you think about how hard it is to start tomorrow, you're not gonna have that two dollars. Because you're still in that mindset of when it's difficult and it's hard to start. So that's that's what I mean by I want everyone when you leave today, it's a it's a shift of your mindset, to shift the way you think about savings, to shift the way that you think about budget. Um, I was very much in situations like yourself where I had to think about saving and putting money aside. And I said to myself, I have to make a change, right? So something that I, I, I'll, I'll do, I'm going a little bit off course here because I can relate to this story. Um, and one thing that I did in situations like this was I opened up multiple savings accounts, right? And only, I kid you not, I have about eight savings accounts. And the reason why I have about eight savings accounts is when my direct deposit comes in, I funnel money into those specific savings accounts. Mm -hmm. But then what I did was I removed those savings accounts from my online banking view. So I can't see it. So if I can't see it, I can't touch it. Mm -hmm. Right? So for example, I'm saving, I, I like to go on vacations. I like to travel. So I have a travel savings account. Each time I get paid, I automatically, when my direct deposit hits, I set it up to that $50 goes into that travel savings account. And I know that every three months, I can go back into this travel savings account, and I'm gonna have about six, $300 in that, in, that, in that travel savings account, right? And that can help me when it comes to what savings. So in your situation, you're mentioning that you know, it's a little bit difficult for you to plan and save for your kids uh, because they want the Jordans, they want the, the new clothes, the Uggs, you can set up a savings account where you just put money aside little by little, and in that time, you will get there, right? It's, it's not gonna happen overnight, but as long as you start and you make the necessary adjustments today, by tomorrow, when tomorrow does come, you will be able to, to have that money aside. I then, I'm also saving for a new car, right? So in my car savings account, I have about $100 each paycheck goes into that car savings account. So that when the time comes and or something happens, I can just go into my car savings account and purchase my car right away. Right now, but one thing that you should realize is when you start saving, it actually becomes addictive. Right, and I I have my money in my car savings account, but I'm like, hmm, that's a nice savings. I don't want a new car. Like I I came all this all this way. I don't need that new car right now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna push this. I'm gonna push this off. Right. I, I see. Uh, you know. That would just sit down. Okay, right. Okay, this is this is good, right. So I, I would encourage you to do the same thing, right. Start putting twenty dollars away, five dollars, whatever it is that you can manage. Because your savings plan is going to be different from my savings plan. My savings plan is going to be different from your savings plan. And as long as you start, then you'll be able to see your money grow over time. And then you, you you will upgrade your account into an account that gives you that requires you to keep a higher balance. When you have your money in like a money market savings account, you're going to see a little bit more interest 
on that money. Yeah, Russell. I would recommend, um, and this is part of what we're going to go into this budget management tool, is I would recommend that you pay off that first. That's how I look at it. But again, uh, savings is something, and mon money management is something that's different for everyone. I prefer to pay off my high interest, I look at my high interest rate um, credit cards, my high interest rate loans, and I would do something that's called a snowball method. So have you guys heard of the snowball method? So with that snowball method, it really does work. I, you start off by um, paying your, your smallest bills, right? You, let's say you have a $1,000 credit card, you have a $3,000 credit card, and then you have a $10,000 credit card. All right, you're gonna make the minimum payments on all those cards except for the smallest one in, within that category. So. So, for example, that that thousand dollar credit card. Let's say that that thousand dollar credit card. It's going to have about a min, a minimum monthly balance, a minimum monthly payment of about fifty dollars um, per month, right? So, what I would do is I would just make the minimum payments on all, but that one credit card that that has a thousand dollar balance. Instead of me paying that minimum of of fifty dollars, I'm going to pay somewhere. I try to go as two or three times that amount. So I'm gonna pay $100 to $150 on that car. What I'm gonna see is, I'm gonna see that money get, uh, that car's gonna get paid off a lot faster. So in about nine months, give or take, depending on how you are, 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 are paying your, your monthly payments back, you then take that $150 and apply that to that second credit card that's 3,000, right? So now, you're, that, that, that credit card that's about 3,000, that monthly payment is gonna be somewhere around $75. You then had 100 and you was paying $125 on your other credit card. You apply that to the second credit card and then you'll see that you'll start to pay that up. What's gonna happen in that process is you're gonna see your credit score start to shoot up you see start to shoot up a lot faster than you normally would. So that's how I would tackle paying down um, credit card debt or paying down any sort of loans. Yes? I have a question, okay. Yes. Uh, uh, what I would do, what I do, is I buy a uh, gift card, mm -hmm. and I use that for my outside eating, you know, at the job and then eat for only for that card. That way, that's budgeted. Mm -hmm. I'm just my other stuff. I need that call for outside eating. I, I love that, right? I love that. So what you're doing is you're actually putting money aside from before. Yeah. So you're. So I don't know if you guys heard, um, but she she buys gift cards for outside eating, and she and when she gets to work or when that time does come to do the outside eating, she just uses those gift cards. So that's another way. Um, to go about saving, right? So instead of uh, when that time comes, instead of you saying, you know what, I'm hungry, I'm about to go to Chipotle and spend an extra $15, you're like, you know what, I already paid for this up front, I'm not gonna spend any more money, I'm gonna use that Chili's gift card, I'm gonna use that, that Pizza Hut gift card, or that Domino's gift card. So that's a great way to go about saving. That is, a, that is a great way to go about saving budgeting. Because one thing is that you have to budget for every single thing in your life. There isn't one thing that you don't budget. Like everything needs to be planned out. Everything needs to be um, on a spreadsheet. That way you know where your money is going. The problem, though, is you don't pay attention to it enough because it's not taught in school anymore. Yeah. Right? Yeah. How to manage your money is 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 not taught in school. Right? And I remember my mom used to say to me all the time, man, when I was growing up, they taught me how to write a checkbook. Like today's kids growing up don't even know what a checkbook is. <laughs> All they know is cash out and sell, right? But the thing about that is the cash out and sell, it's convenient, but with that convenience, you lose track of what's actually in your account because you're just spending because it's so convenient. It's easier for you to spend money, whereas 
before it's like I had to go to the bank, right? And with going to the bank, to, I had to go to the bank to get cash out. Now it's on a card. So you just swipe. And you just swipe. It's like, oh, it didn't get declined? You just keep swiping and swiping and swiping. And then you go look at your account. Oh, I'm in the negative. How did this happen? Right? How did this happen? And that's why I, I mentioned budgeting is very important because you have to track every single thing that, you, that you're spending your money on because now spending your money is so convenient. Yes? Yeah. That's two out of eight. What are the other ones? Oh, okay, I can get you into that, right? So, yes, so I have, um, I have my travel savings account. I have a, uh, my car savings account. I have a short-term savings account. The purpose of my short-term savings account is when I, when I run out of money in my spending account, right, I take money from my short-term savings account. My long-term savings account, I don't touch. My long-term savings account, I don't touch that long-term savings account because that's my money that I'm saving for a rainy day. I then have a bills account. So what I do is I calculate how much bills I have, right? And when I, I divide how much my bills are and when my direct deposit hits, it just automatically comes out of the bills account. And I set everything up for automatic payments. So when the money comes in from my direct deposit, if it, it's not gonna come out of my main checking account because my main checking account is only for spending. So when I look at my account, I see what's on my card and that's all I have to spend. My bills account is all my bills come out of that account automatically. So the reason why I separate it like this is it, I don't have to worry about is my car payment gonna get paid this month? Is my cell phone gonna get paid this month? I already budgeted for that up front. That money's all over there. What's in my spending account is only what I have to spend. So if I only have three hundred dollars, I best not. Go, I better not go try to buy some new Jordans because that's just not what I should be doing with my money, right? And I think that's what uh, what I want to for everyone to, to take away today is come up with a plan on how to budget your money. No, no, no. So, so then, I, 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 you want to get nosy, I can get, you can get nosy, right? So then I have a savings account for my life insurance. Life insurance. My life insurance. So the life insurance policy that I have, I pay annually instead of paying monthly because if you pay, if you pay annually, it's cheaper than yeah. monthly. So I, in that account, it's about, that turns out to be $600 a year. So each time I get paid, my direct deposit, it works out to be like $33 goes into that account, and then every year, that account gets pulled, $600 comes out of that account. So that account goes down, down to zero, so I never have to worry about that. It just, it just happens automatically. Yes? Right, so the reason why you would use the snowball method is eventually it's going to catch up, right? So the, the reason why you use the snowball method is because you, you have already put yourself in a bad situation and you, the interest rates are gonna, you're gonna get charged with interest rates regardless. So what I would recommend that you do is you cut that credit card up. So what I would recommend that you do, um, or everyone in this room, that minimum payment serves as a minimum payment. Never pay the minimum payment. Never pay that minimum payment. You always wanna pay two or three times that minimum payment. So if your minimum payment's $100, then try to come up with $300 to, to pay that because that interest rate is gonna keep growing and growing and growing, and then you're gonna have a very difficult time paying that off. Take a look at your credit card statements when you get them, and if you look at the um, if you look at the minimum payment, and you see how long it's going to take you to pay that off, you will realize that sometimes it's going to take you 
five, ten years to pay off a thousand dollar balance. Message. That's not okay. You have to you have to pay more than that minimum payment so you pay that credit card down so you don't continuously be in that debt. Yes. Yes, you can, you, that's a very good point. You can call your credit card, um, you can call your credit card company and ask them to do, uh, to see if they could lower that, that, uh, that interest rate. That is sometimes possible. Another thing that I would recommend uh, is what, it's called a balance transfer, right? So now, sometimes um, uh, that is a good option to lowering your debt, doing a balance transfer. So for those of you who don't know what a balance transfer is, um, credit, credit card companies, banks, financial institutions, you're able to open another credit card, and with opening another credit card, you're able to carry that balance over, and they usually give you about, depending on the credit card, they can give you uh, about 12 months, zero interest rates on a balance transfer, or 18 months on a balance transfer. What I do, or what I educate my clients to do is, if you have a uh, $1,000 credit card that you're having a difficult time paying off, do a balance transfer to another financial institution with zero interest rates for that 12 months. Then you divide that $1,000 into 12 and you pay that off within that 12 months. And at the end of that 12 months, you're not gonna have any that credit card debt. But it takes that discipline to actually make sure that you're budgeting your money accordingly to make sure that you're not um, any more interest. Yes. The fifteen three. Yes, that is another option as well, uh, making multiple payments within the billing cycle to um, bring your, your, your credit, credit, credit uh, utilization. So when you make a, a credit card payment, and I know my time is getting cut because they're shutting me off over here, uh, but when you make multiple um, payments on your credit card, what that's going to do is that's going to allow you to pay less in interest. So for example, let's say that uh, you have a $1,000 credit card. Right, and you make a payment of $100. The remaining $900 is going to be charged, with, with, which you guys should know, credit card interest is about uh, 18, 19, 20%. So that $900 is going to get charged an additional 18%, which is more than what that minimum payment is. However, if you, let's say that you make a payment of $100 on that $1,000 amount, and then you make another payment of uh, Another hundred dollars, only the eight hundred dollars you can charge that eighteen percent. So you're saving money like that way. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. Twenty nine percent. That is a, a very high interest rate on a credit card. So the score credit cards are, is something that I would be, I would, I would tell everyone and tell you guys not to do it, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, <laughs> you should have a credit card with a financial institution, find something that has a cash back, something that can travel points, not something that you can only use at one store, unless you really love that store like Macy's, right? <laughs> Macy's. Yes. 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 Can I ask that you just repeat the question so um, before you answer it? Okay. okay. Uh, does anyone? Yes, right over here. <laughs>
So my savings accounts are not high yield. And the reason why my savings accounts are not high yield is because um, I use them and I, and I use them to pay my bills. So what happens is the, 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 the balance goes down low because of when my bills come out. Now, the, the reason why I have my, my account set up that way and I have it being automatically direct deposit is the account that I have, if you have a direct deposit of $25 or more, that automatically waives the monthly service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm not paying any fees on all of the, say, all of the eight savings accounts I have because I make sure that I have a direct deposit of at least $25 to go into those accounts to avoid that fee. So even if, if that account drops down to zero, but within that billing cycle, I'm going to have a direct deposit of more than $25, so I'm not paying any fees on my savings accounts. Now, my, what happens though is my long-term savings accounts and my car savings accounts that I have, those have a higher balance. So as I'm building my savings account up and I realize that my account now has, meets the minimum for a, high, a higher yield savings account, but sometimes a high yield savings account, you have to maintain a minimum balance of like 3,500 in that account, what I do is I go to the bank and I convert my account into a higher yield savings account so that I'm getting more interest on my money as opposed to the, the lower savings account. Great question. Hope with Operation Hope, you provide credit and money management services, right? One-on-one -on -one counseling. We do these workshops often throughout the city. And guess what? It's all free. We don't charge for this. Um, so Melissa's Specialty is actually small business, but we both, we both do credit money management, yes. <laughs> I myself am a HUD approved housing counselor, so that's why I'm here today to talk to you guys about getting you mortgage ready. I'm not gonna spend too much time um, because the object is to really get you guys in on a one-on-one -on -one to give you that individual counseling that you need. We look at your credit report, yes. We look at your finances in depth. So we're looking at income, savings, all that information that Nikoi gave you. Um, you know, again, utilizing your bank reps for these services is great. This is something that you're gonna need in order to get prepared for that house, for home buying, for home purchasing, being a homeowner, mortgage ready. So, Operation Hope has been around for 32 years, right? We're here in the community more so to provide financial literacy, right? Inclusion for all is the, the mission. With this inclusion, we're here to just really give you that hand. I don't, I don't know how I can express that more than anything. We have a hand-holding situation where we can carry you through the process of helping you reach your financial goals. For time's sake, let's get right to it, the credit piece. I'm not gonna to spend too much because even Nikoi gave you some great advice on how to manage credit. One of the, uh, up here on the screen behind me is the three C's to mortgage lending. And lending is how the lenders look at you as an applicant, right? Capacity, credit, and collateral. Actually, I would start with credit first. Because to even get in the door to apply for a loan, to even get in the door, you have to have a certain minimum credit score. All right, especially in the world of a mortgage, when you're applying for a mortgage, you have to have a minimum credit score. And I'll tell you, generally, across the, the board, it's the minimum middle credit score of 620 or higher, right? So if you know right off the bat that you're over 620 or higher, I would suggest to go ahead and take that next step and just put in a nice little application for a pre-approval to see where you stand. But if you know for sure you're below 620, you know you have some credit work to do. And that's okay, right? You have to start somewhere. And that's, again, that's where me and Melissa come in to work with credit and money management, right? That handhold the situation. Um, so, Let's talk about credit a little bit. The first, well, I'm gonna put credit first. Let's talk about credit. We already know, okay, you have to have a minimum credit score of 620, minimum middle credit score. When I say middle, that means the mortgage lenders are pulling all three credit reports. Jeff is gonna go into this a lot more deeper. He, he's gonna give you a little bit more insight on this. 
but you, they're pulling all three reports at the same time, and they're looking at that middle credit score to base your approval on. Once you get past that mark, now they're looking at your credit report in depth, right? They're looking at the details, and this is where it really counts. That credit score just got you in the door. But now they're looking at your credit profile to see what your financial reputation looks like, right? How well you kept your promise to pay in the past helped them determine how well you keep your promise to pay in the future. That is the ultimate definition of credit reputation. Um, so in that case, they're looking for how long have you kept up with on-time payments, right? On-time payments is extremely serious for a mortgage lender because you're taking on a loan for 15, 20, 30 years. It's a long term. So the bank want to make sure that you're going to sufficiently supply this payment every month, right? So they're looking at how long have you kept up payments on your credit report? Two years or more. I'll give you guys that tip. Has to be two years or more, right? And then they're also looking at your debt. How much debt do you have on your credit report? Showing on your credit. How much outstanding debt that you haven't tackled yet? Like collections, charge-offs, closed accounts with balances. Very important. If it's a lot, you know that's a red flag to them. Either way, it's a red flag. But they're looking at it in depth. And then they're also looking to see how much debt you, you actually have to pay on a monthly basis. So they're looking to see accumulation of your total monthly payments. Right? This helps them look at your debt to income ratio, which Jeff will definitely talk about in debt. So, you know, credit is very important. We have to clean up that credit report. You have to clean up that credit report. In the first place, I'm going to suggest to anybody to start is annualcreditreport.com. It's been around forever. I can't tell you when they start the site. <laughs> but however, it's there for our purpose. All, the three major credit bureaus put it together so that they can supply an in-depth credit report from them to us. And it's free. Generally, it's free to us once a year. But now, since the pandemic, it's free to us once a week. So you have access to these free credit reports once a week. If, and now, once you get past that point, right, you're gonna look at these reports, you're gonna clean it up, get real good in depth with it. I mean, when I say clean it up, I mean clean up your name, because you know they're reporting several spellings of your name. I don't know if my name is on the screen, no. My name is Preditha, right? Y'all heard that, Preditha? <laughs> so I'm always, <laughs> I'm always telling everybody to call me pre. Guess what, right? But just imagine how many different name variations have been reported on me to my credit report, right? Not only that, I'm named after my grandmother, and my grandmother started me out with bad credit. <laughs> right. So I've had to do some cleanup work with my credit report. Do that cleanup work. Look at the date of births your social security numbers, right? Your addresses, your current address, yes, but guess what, previous addresses. There are several previous addresses that show up. I've had so many clients that say, oh my God, I don't know where that address came from, I never lived there, right? They live in Philly and there's a North Carolina address that shows up. Or it's their, you know, ex address or something. Let's get that cleaned up, because guess what? <coughs> This information could be pulling some negative information onto your credit report as well. So that's, that's one of the major reasons why you want to clean it up. You want it to represent you. No matter if it's a bad score or a good score, you still want to make sure it's you. It's, you, it's who you are, your identity. Okay? Then we want to look into the accounts, right? We're looking at the accounts in depth to see if the Companies, the credit card companies, the loan companies are reporting the information right. Because they're human too behind those digital screens and they could be making mistakes. So we want to fact check. One thing I can tell you guys, I've been in the mortgage industry for over 20 something years. I know one thing, they track everything, right? They, you know, back in the day it was paperwork. <laughs> now it's all digital, but they track everything. So guess what? Whenever you're filing for a loan, uh, applying for a loan, especially a mortgage loan, it's extremely important that you do what they do. You keep track of everything, right? You have to hold on to that information and stay on top of it so you can stay on top of them because they make mistakes too. 
Now, as far as the credit information, that annual credit report, though, is very important. So pull that, go through that with a fine tooth. Is it, is it fine tooth and comb? I, I'm going to just say that. Fine comb, tooth comb, tooth. That's it. Go through it, right? Real in depth. Then the next thing, let's get, let's get past that point. Well, let me give you guys this tip. Make sure you sign up with a, a site like Experian. Experian.com offers a free membership. Credit Karma, I'm getting to that next. Okay, awesome. So make sure you sign up with the, tell them to set you up on Experian. Experian is a great website. They offer you unlimited Experian credit report and they offer you a FICO score, All right? I, you heard the word FICO. FICO score is very important to know because mortgage lenders look at FICO scores. It actually boosts you, okay. So do you pay for the service? What it is, I pay for the service. No, I don't pay for this. You don't pay, okay. I transfer money from my bank to Experian. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the part they call it? And then I pay my gas and gas for three bags. Okay. Utilities. Okay. So you just put me on to something, another service that they offer. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. And, and I, I love the site. I'll be right over here. I love the site for Experian because they do offer several services. They offer a lot of services under the free membership, but they also offer services where you can pay for it. You can actually pay for it. And, I, and, and as a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, in one-on-one -on -one counseling, I can get in depth with that. I don't want to go too far into that because we have, we have to get the depth, which is the really important part of this home buying situation, right? But um, Credit Karma is a good one to have as well. And I'll tell you why they're good. Credit Karma is good because they give you real-time credit information. They're tracking TransUnion and Equifax. But here's the thing with Credit Karma. Credit Karma doesn't provide you a FICO score. Remember, I just said FICO. Credit Karma provides you a Vantage score. Nothing wrong with Vantage, but the mortgage lenders don't look at Vantage. They look at FICO. So we want to know our FICO scores. Um, one of the other things I like about Experian, you can actually see your mortgage FICO score under Experian Ad. <laughs> I just said something crazy, didn't I? Mortgage FICO. What's the difference between a mortgage FICO score and a FICO score? Here's the thing. There's several different FICO scores out there. Visit myfico.com, okay, myfico.com. When you go to myfico.com, select education, and you'll be privy to all the different information that is under uh, the different versions of FICO scores, right? Generally, you'll see your consumer credit score, which is a FICO score eight. But there are FICO scores from 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10, T, and so forth. And each one is valuable to particular lenders. Message! That's one of the reasons why it could be different. All right, get to know that. It's valuable information. So I'm glad you guys pulled this screen up because this is where I was going to next talk about credit. So in the credit world, this pie chart here, you guys can search this on Google. Just Google credit pie chart, credit score pie chart. When you Google credit score pie chart, you'll see several different versions of this, but the main important thing is that there's five categories that make up your credit score. Five categories, so let me see here. Can I see that? But I know them, all right. Let's start with the biggest part. The biggest part of this pie chart is payment history, 35%. I'm gonna say it again. Payment history, 35%. That's the biggest part of your credit score. Very important. That means when you start or have already started this credit journey, and I'm gonna call it a credit game, you have to make sure you can structure yourself to make on-time payments no matter <coughs> what. Right, if, you're, if your credit score is very important to you, on-time payments is first and foremost. So like Nikoi was talking about his, the budgeting piece, that's what you budget, you factor those payments and you make sure that it's accounted for every month. Yes, even some people ask questions about that minimum payment. I'm glad somebody asked those questions because that's very important to understand. Minimum payments 
don't get you too far, but they get you far. Did that make sense? Yeah. I'm about to explain to you why, what I said. The next category, amounts owed 30%. Amounts owed 30%. This is actually also called credit utilization. Amounts owed 30% is re in reference to your credit card usage. So it only relates to your credit cards. Credit card usage is determined that you're a responsible use user of this if you only spend 30% or less of your credit limit. 30% or less of your credit limit. So I'm looking at all of y'all because I'm trying to see if y'all face look like, whoa, because when I was first taught about credit, I was told that if I make my minimum payment, I can max out my credit card, but I'll be fine if I make my minimum payment. Right? I, I, I hear some people that's in with me, right? Well, that's not the case. That's only a part of the battle. The other part of that battle is keeping your balance below 30%, mm -hmm. right? So what's one of the ways, I can give y'all a quick tip on how to manage that. Go back to your budget. You're taking, especially if you're starting out with this credit journey. Utilize your credit card you now, set it up to pay something that you already account for in your budget, okay? Something like uh, those subscriptions we mentioned. If you know you can't live without Netflix, Put Netflix to your credit card bill, right? Automatic withdrawal. And then with the automatic withdrawal to come out, and then you can have automatic withdrawal from your checking account to your payment of your credit card. Very, sounds very simple, right? But you have to switch up your mindset to set your budget up this way. All right, so that's one tip. Now, I just mentioned 65% of your credit score. Make your payments on time. Over a period of time, because banks like to see this. They like to see that you can make payments on time over a long period of time, especially a mortgage lender. Because remember, you're making payments for 15, 20, 30 years. That's your, your contract, your agreement with the bank, with this mortgage loan. And they want to make sure, they're looking at your credit report to see if you got any other long-term loan, long-term payment loans on your credit report to show, okay, can this person manage making long-term payments, long-term payments? So that's very important. Manage, so if you guys don't take anything else from here today, please, 65% of your credit score is managing your credit by making payments on time and keeping your credit card balances below 30% of the limit. Very important. Now, oh, real quick, okay. So if you, um, okay, say you in trouble with your credit and you're trying to get a mortgage and say you, um, wasn't paying your payments on time, but then you make a lump sum, how would the bank perceive that as far as moving you forward? So, wait, say that again, one more time. Okay, so, so, so wasn't, making payments. wasn't making payments, but then all of a sudden you made a lump sum payment to pay it completely off. Mm -hmm. How would a bank view that as far as giving you a mortgage? And this is a credit card, not a loan. Um, yeah, credit card or loan, if you can answer. So those are two different things. So credit card, so it sounds like you de defaulted. If you wasn't making payments over a long period of time and then decided to make a long sum, long, uh, lump sum payment, it sounds like you defaulted. Okay, is that the case, Bob? A scenario, okay. Yes, that's a rear flag, right? That's a rear flag because there was some lacks in payments. Mm -hmm. And first and foremost, I mentioned earlier that Payments, like not just, you know, payments on time, payments over a period of time, but two years of good payment history. That's what they're really looking at, that two year time frame. On time, two years or more. No, don't stop at two years, you gotta keep going. I'm not gonna go too much further. Let me keep going on, on this pie chart, at least, and then I wanna introduce Jeff. Um, so the next biggest part of this pie chart is 15% length of credit history. That's going back to that 24 months or more. That's when you really start to see is this part of the uh, scoring start to take effect, right? Doesn't mean that you can't have a good credit score beforehand. You know, I'll tell you this, here's a tip. If you haven't established, or if you do have poor credit or you need to reestablish credit, starting off, I've had clients who go from zero to 750 in six, six months, right? And, and, you know, following my suggestions, and even if they start from the 400 range, 
they end up in the 600 ring in six months. So, you know, and again, credit cards is probably the fastest way to get there. As when I tell you, there's no secret sauce to this. There's no secret sauce to credit building. You have to do the work. And the work mainly refers back to making payments on time and keeping credit card balances below 30% of the credit limit. Next part is credit mix, 10%. Another 10% goes into your credit score is credit mix. And that's when you can show on your credit report that you have both what's called installment loans and revolving accounts, which is credit cards. Installment loans are your fixed loans, fixed interest rate, fixed term, same payment every month. At the end of that, that's it. You pay that debt off, that loan off. What are installment loans, right? Car loans, mortgage loans, personal loans. Those are installment loans. So if you can show in your credit report that you can manage payments with your credit card and your car loan at the same time, that goes into your credit score as a plus. However, it doesn't mean you can't have a good credit score if you don't have both, because you can. But that's just another count, right? It can benefit you. And again, mortgage lenders are looking for that type of history. They love to see that if you have good long-term payments with another installment loan lender. All right, so if you got car payments, keep up on those, don't, please don't let them last, especially if this is your goal. However, if you do, don't fret. There's always, you know, a ch another chance. You just gotta stay focused. Next, the last one is new credit. This category is to another 10% that goes into your credit score. New credit is basically whenever you apply and you're approved and you open up a new credit card, a new loan, and that, new credit limit now increases your overall credit limit, right? That's a plus. That shows the next lender or credit or hey, this person, you know, they got a good reputation. Other people like them, other lenders, you know, the credit card companies. They like them, so let me see what they're about and uh, check them out, right? The opposite to that, though, is if you apply and you're denied, right? And now that's called a what? A hard inquiry. You guys heard of hard inquiries. Hard increase can affect your credit. It takes a couple points, it's in this 10% range. So anything that I've mentioned in these categories, the opposite can, can affect you in that same percentage, right? 10% goes into new credit, but if you get a hard increase, that's about 10% of your score that gets taken away. And a hard increase, basically, whenever you apply for a loan or credit, right, you're applying to borrow money, and you get, well, you, anytime you apply, it really goes against you as a hard inquiry with the financial institution. However, it, it, adjusts, it, it adjusts itself when you are approved. You won't really see the effect, but if you're not approved, you'll see the effect of it. That makes sense. So that's what I'm here for, to help make sense of all that information I just gave you guys, right? As a credit counselor, get with your credit counselors, get with your bank reps, get this information. Get it a plan. This is the main reason why we're here and we work with the communities that we want to make sure we put a plan in place for you, help you put a plan in place. Because I don't really necessarily want to give you the plan. I want to help you figure out the plan because everybody's plan is different. But you all have a financial goal, right? Right now, you know, all of you might have different financial goals. There's different subjects going on here today, right, that they're talk we're all speaking about. They all take this information. You have to have your finances in order, budgeting, right? Managing your, your income in every, every fashion, utilizing your bank to the best, credit, right? You have to get it in order. Use your counselors, we're here for free. Anybody have any questions before I pass it over to Jeff? And we'll go to this gentleman. Oh, thank you. When you were mentioning uh, new credit, I have a firm, you know, I noticed a firm is go to different sites and it pops up and I use them. So when I started having when I happened when I went to a firm's site, I can actually pay off each one as it comes up separate. Or they actually give me separate loans <coughs> in the firm. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. So you're talking about the payment and you're talking about the payment plan that comes up under a lot of retailers. They give you the option, right, to break it down. A firm yes, if you're so if you made a plan under each purchase, right? So like say you go to get a phone or say you go to uh, maybe furniture or something like that, they give you the option to choose a firm as your financial plan, right? The payment, payment plan. That's more than one loan. 
right? So you're asking. Basically, what they did was when I first applied, they gave me two thousand dollars, right? Right. This is all right. But as I have purchased five different things, I noticed that I can actually go and pay a little more money, a little more money to pay these. Homes. Right. Would that be considered like new credit because they signed up? Yes. They're reported to the credit uh, credit bureaus. Okay. Yep, that's that's considered new credit. So here, let me make a point too, real quick. Installment loans. One other question would be installment loans. Guys, remember, loans credit is debt, right? It's debt. So when I so you got to go interchangeable. Debt debt and credit is interchangeable. Your credit is your debt. Your debt is your credit. Right? There's good debt, there's bad debt. Right? There's good credit, there's bad credit. I'm saying that because we tend to not think about it in that way. And for instance, prime example, I have clients that say, Pri, I want to pay off my car loan early. Right? And this is a fixed loan. The main thing you have to do on your car loan, which is an installment loan, is make payments on time monthly. You don't have to really worry about the balance. Because credit cards, is that tell me, does that mean it's over? <laughs> <laughs> but with installment loans, remember, right, it's a fixed loan. And when you're done paying that installment loan, that's it. It's not a revolving debt, it's not credit cards. Credit cards can continuously go on and on and on, right? As long as you make payments on time, keep it balanced up, they're gonna wanna creep, increase your credit limit, right? And that's another one that goes into that new credit uh, category. Anytime you get a credit limit increase, it will help your credit score. But credit card companies, they want to keep you. They love you. They want to keep you around because you keep them paid, right? So, but loans, lenders, installment loans are set. They're just what they are. When you're done paying them off, that's it. So I've had, you know, for example, I've had a client say, hey, Pri, I paid my car loan, yay, but what happened to my credit? Yeah. You know, mixed emotions, and I'm like, Ooh. Listen, as soon as you pay that, that debt off, you now have no more credit, right? That credit is now gone. You now have to offset it. So remember that, right? Don't pay your car loan off too early. Because <laughs> it does help. As long as you're making those payments on time, it helps build your credit score. Um, if someone adds you to their line of credit, if they have credit, how can that affect my credit? Great, that's great. Make sure. You are, um, you know, as somebody you can trust, right? <laughs> I'll be, here's, a, here's a client example. That's a great option. She just said if, uh, if someone adds me on to their credit line as an authorized credit card user, and you, you can do that and don't even have to take the credit card and use it, right? You just, it, what will happen is that person's good credit history will start to report to your credit report, and it will boost your credit score. Make sure it's a person who um, you can trust, who you know has great credit, you know, credit reporting history, who stays and keeps up on time with their payments and so forth. Um, clear example, client of mine, he's now breaking up with his girlfriend. Yeah, he says, pretty, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I wanna apply for this mortgage like this month and I'm, I'm ready. We worked a full year together to get him in place, you know, for this mortgage. And he said, he went back to the two credit cards that he's an authorized user on under his girlfriend. Now his ex, well, going to be his ex, I don't know. But however, that was the conversation. And I said, ooh, I'm gonna pray for you. Because he's scared that she's now gonna pull that credit from him, right? So just be, you know, be mindful of those things, you know, personal situations, okay? One last, Question. If you want to start building your children's credit, how do you go about that? Like, my daughter, she's 15. Should I add her as an authorized user to one of my credit cards? So, me, I'm a firm believer not to start till they're 18. Okay? I, I'm a firm believer not to start any of those. That's that type of thing. Well, I mean, don't get me wrong. You should definitely start young and budgeting, teaching them about banking. Right? Savings, definitely start now, right? But credit, I'm a firm believer in waiting until they're 18. And in that case, that would be something I can talk to you, but I will tell you guys right offhand, 
if you don't have credit, right, establishing credit, um, and this is something I'm going to leave for you, but we can talk one-on-one -on -one about this and get more in-depth. Maybe the church will bring you back and have another broad workshop on credit and money management, or credit mainly. But secure credit cards, right, and credit bills. And I know they're, they're a little, I was shaky about them years ago, too. Somebody told me about a secure credit card. I said, I got to do what? I got to put my money into this? Uh-uh. I'm good enough that they should put their money with me. They should give me their money, but that's not the case. As a bank, you got to look at it like this. They're investing in you, right? So then they got to make sure they can trust you. So how are you able to you know, show that if you don't have a credit history or if you have poor credit history? So you gotta have some form of showing them like, hey, I'm trustworthy. And the secure credit cards is the best way to do that and credit build the loans. Nicole? So I have a, um, something to combat that as well. I do agree with Pre, where she says to wait until they're 18 uh, because I've seen this happen a lot of times. Uh, you know, we want to add our young children on our credit cards but sometimes something happens to us, and it happens to us, and we are, and we default on our credit cards, we're setting them up to default. So I will wait until they're 18. Uh, a secured credit card is a great option, but financial institutions, a lot of financial institutions, they have what's called a college credit card, specifically for college students, and they put them through different um, credit criteria. So they don't necessarily have to have income, because their income could be their allowance. Right, but they're gonna start them off with a credit card of let's say $500, uh, and then they, you could, we could do something like we're talking about subscriptions, and set them off with a subscription. Hey, now you have your own Netflix account, you have your own phone bill account. Uh, I think Netflix is a great way um, to start an 18 year old off on how to build their credit. Put your Netflix up to your credit card. It's, it's you know, I think it's up now, but it's uh, about $10 a month. Um, 12. 25. 25. 25. Uh, 25. <laughs> Showing my age. <laughs> um, but so it's something with like $25 a month. They have their own Netflix account. They can have it all. I have to pay my Netflix bill over and over and over. By the time they graduate, they have four years of paying, paying their credit on time. Then what happens is they want, after they graduate um, college, they're looking to buy their first home or they're looking to get their own car at this point now. They've had four years of uh, good credit history. Thank you, Nikoi. That's awesome. Yeah, and he's right, right? Jeff Hill here is the mortgage sales officer as well. He's the sales manager for the mortgage loan office with uh, Fulton Bank. I've been in the mortgage industry, and I'm, I'm playing up Jeff right here, right? But it, it's, it's true. I've been in the mortgage industry behind scenes operations for over 20 years, and I've never seen a group of loan officers who are passionate in helping their borrowers as much as they are. So I want to hand it over to Jeff. So the mortgage process, in its simplest form, as we covered already, is credit, income, and assets. It's that simple. Three separate factors. On the mortgage side, so you heard about credit, but I'm going to talk about credit as a loan officer, as the person that would be pulling the credit to qualify somebody for a mortgage. So we're going to kind of do it as if we're doing this application. When we pull the credit, we do look at the score. The score is what you do as a starting qualifier. But one of the things about credit that we're looking at is we're looking at the story. But again, as a loan officer, what story are we looking at? When you create your budget, you're gonna figure out what kind of home you wanna buy and how much you want your monthly payment to be. Well, the bank is also gonna look at that application and they're gonna figure out how much can we lend this person? How much of a payment can they afford? There are gonna be times where that number might not match up, and most often than not, it will happen that the bank qualifying you is not gonna be the same number that you're probably gonna be looking for, and let me give you a couple reasons why. Somebody mentioned about authorized user accounts. Well, it goes both ways. If you add an account to your credit that you might not necessarily be paying, if it shows up on the credit, it's counting against you. Now there are nuances where you can not have account against you. I don't want to get too deep into the weeds, but if anybody in here has ever co-signed for a car, you gotta ask yourself, did you ever co-sign for a car? If that shows up on your credit, and you're gonna say, well, I don't understand. Why am I not being approved for more? Well, your monthly obligations are X. And you're like, that doesn't sound right. There's two cars reporting on your credit report. 
Well, the other one I just signed for, it's not my car. If it's on your credit, it's going to count against you. So in terms of the process to prepare for applying for a mortgage, as Pre and Nikoi mentioned, you want to get everything in order before you apply. So if that's a factor, you need to address it up front. I've also seen collections that pop up and somebody says, I have no collections. Did you sign for somebody's cell phone? It went into default, it's on your credit, it affected your score. Fair? That's the story it's telling. The last piece of the puzzle, in terms of credit, and I'm going through the expedited version of this, is when somebody is using their assets, their cash, their bank account, and they want to prepare for a house, and I'm never against anybody paying off debt, but you have a certain amount of money that you have access to at this time. So if anybody pulls up their bank account, you have X amount of money, either bank account, 401k, et cetera. You have a monthly payment that's reporting on, say, your credit card. And say that credit card is $50 minimum payment, balance $3,000, just as an example. And somebody says, I want to pay off debt before I buy a house. But if you take $3,000 of cash to pay off a credit card for a $50 monthly payment, you got to figure out is that helping you buy the house you want? Or are you taking the assets that you needed for closing costs or down payment, and now you took a step back? Now again, I'm not ever telling anybody not to pay off debt, but the beauty of getting pre-approved for a mortgage is we cover that to make sure that you know, listen, you want the house here. If you're able to do X, Y, and Z and pay these debts off, then it becomes part of the plan. If your debt to income ratio was already low, but you used your assets to pay off more debt, now you hinted yourself because you might fall short on down payment and closing costs. That's the story in terms of how a lender looks at credit. So we talked about things to show up with there. One of the things which now is becoming more apparent is student loans. Student loans, when it comes to applying for a mortgage, if you haven't done so, Applying for an income-based repayment is obviously important. When I start covering a couple about the mortgage products, if you do have student loans, also if you sign for, say, your child's student loans or somebody else's student loans, keep in mind, if it's on your credit, it's going to count against you. One of the biggest things that happened for the last couple of years, everybody was in the firm because of COVID. But the problem is you didn't have a mortgage, oh, sorry, you didn't have a student loan payment, but it was reporting on your credit, and if you got a conventional loan or an FHA loan or a VA loan, if you're a veteran, each one of those required a payment to be counted against you. It could have been 1% of the balance, and we all know student loans are not 5,000 at a time, or FHA required half, a half of the balance, half a percent of the balance, and that would have counted against you. So that's all part, when you're reviewing credit, that's what we're going through initially. So in the pre-approval process, when we're reviewing credit, yes, score is important. It just starts the conversation, but also what items are on there. There are scenarios where if you miss payments, there's a system that really looks at the overall picture. So don't panic if you miss a payment here and there. I don't recommend doing so, but a lot of people panic a little bit too much on that. So then we're gonna cover income. So I'm gonna cover, when it comes to applying for a mortgage, what can we use as income? And this is where it gets a little bit complicated. In the simplest form, you have a job, they give you a W-2, they pay you hourly or salary, right? I'll make this a little bit more interactive. Does anybody know anything else, any other income you can think of that would qualify for a mortgage if you were to apply? Alimony, alimony does count. Child support. Child support. So I'm gonna talk about child support for a second. So child support does count. If it's court ordered, you need, and again, depending on the program, it changes court order, but you also have to prove receipt of the child support. You can't really have gaps. It could be voluntary, it doesn't have to be court ordered, but most programs require it to be 12 months, no missed payments. So if you were getting child support voluntarily and then two months gap, because again, everything that we're talking about comes back to one factor. Is the bank putting you in position to succeed or fail? That means when we start talking about employment, child support, alimony, there's a couple others, I'll just go through it because again, we're on a time crunch. Social security. Social Security, if you collect it on behalf of somebody else, that could also be used as qualified income if you're the one receiving it. So if you're the beneficiary, if I'm saying that right? Mm -hmm. Benefit person Benefit. for a person, say a child or a parent, you can use that to qualify for a mortgage. But it's important that when you apply, you let people know that this is part of your income. 
Child support, nobody really asks you for. You have to tell them, it's actually against the law for something. Do you receive child support or do you pay? Um, but also keep in mind, if you pay child support, that counts against you. So besides your credit, it will also be recorded as a liability against you. Same with judgments or tax liens, etc. And again, this is getting into the real details. But these are all additional items that can be used to qualify. So when you're thinking about purchasing a home, you want to also make sure that you know everything that can be used to help with the purchase. Because some people will start going into, can I get a cosigner? But you want to make sure that you're using all of the income that you have and talk to your lender and say, this is what I received. If you receive child support, you have to make sure the child is 15 or younger because what you're looking for is a three-year continuance. Same thing with Social Security, same thing with most other, like if you're on Workman's Comp, there has to be a three-year continuance. So chances are, if you're 15, so it means if you're about to close on the loan and the child turns 16, you can't use that income anymore. And that upsets a lot of people. And I've been through that conversation. Um, Renting a room out in your home, so border, border income. So instead of rental income, they call it border income. You can use border income if you have a history of it and you have a paper trail of it. And everything in this mortgage, everything we're discussing, none of it can be a story. Everything has to be in black and white. So anything you tell the lender has to be followed by a paper trail. Okay, that's the most important thing. And some of the things we talked about, about like technology, um, if you sign for somebody's car, I'm just gonna go into this and then we're gonna get into mortgage products. If you sign for somebody's car, for example, if they pay you the money and you pay the car, it's your debt accounts against you. If they show for the last 12 months they paid the car on their own, we don't have to count it against you. Does that make sense? You wanna hear it again? If you sign for something for somebody, Almost all debt, if in the last 12 months, 12 months, not 10, not five, not six, 12 months that person paid the debt themselves from their own account, the money never touched your hand, we can exclude that debt. That's one note, if that's part of the plan, make sure, because if you're not doing it that way now, you start doing it that way. Because if you have to have that debt excluded to qualify, you want to start sooner than later. So we covered credit. We talked about the monthly payment. We talked about income, the different sources. You also want to make sure, again, with the story, your income is consistent. That's what we're looking for. A couple items, just if, if these uh, items matter. When you're ready to apply, the documentation component, make sure you know where your W-2s are for the last two years. Make sure you can access your tax returns. So make sure you have an ability to deliver it to the lender. So the, no pictures, no snapshots, full documentation, Nothing redacted. The more prepared you are, and then when you meet with a counselor like Pre, those are the files that go through like butter, because you're already prepared for the process. No surprises. So when we take this information, you'll see it on here for sample documentation. So if you take a picture on here, you'll see two-year tax returns, two-year W-2s, 30 days of pay stubs. If you're self-employed, two-year tax returns. If you're self-employed, we do not look at your gross income we look at how much did you pay after taxes. We look at that number. So if you made $100,000 and you made $80,000 disappear in expenses, you made $20,000. Message! Okay, so that's important. Cutting agreement of sale. Like I said, I'm not a big fan of the slides, but it does go to the bottom about social security, pension. So making sure that, again, you can find all of the documentation. If you're using child support, you have to know where the court order is. You have to be able to print the receipt off the online website. All the documentation has to be complete. Now, what happens once we've gathered all this information? And by the way, I'm gonna conclude with the, the grant opportunities, okay? But I wanna make sure you know how we talk about the mortgage before we get into the grants and how they work together. So, so when you figure out the mortgage opportunity, you'll hear terms like conventional, FHA, hopefully you've heard of that, VA loans, PHFA, it's a bond loan, Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency. So these are all products that what we try to do is figure out where can we put you based on what you're eligible for first. So we talked about credit score. Every lender has different requirements. So I don't want to say that 
I can talk about what Fulton Bank does, but I do want to say that for an FHA loan, you can go, technically speaking, technically speaking, to 500. It's just difficult or impossible to get. You can go to 580, 580 and above with FHA, you can still do 3.5% down. Again, it's just, it just gets more expensive. Fulton Bank doesn't do anything under 620. A little history on why that number is, the default rate under 620 was too excessive, so that's where we had to draw a line. Every institution gets greater than their production. That's why every lender is different on what their appetite is for products. Credit score 620. But for Fulton, Beck, for Fulton Bank, you need a 620. Now again, it's just because history dictated when Fulton was doing lending below 620, the default rate was too high, we almost lost our ability to originate FHA loans. Now again, it's, that's what, when you're looking at opportunity, that's why one lender might have an appetite for below 620, one above. On a conventional loan, so this list, now again, I'm gonna talk about Fulton primarily, because I don't wanna talk about anybody else if you have. One of our newer products we created a year ago, you'll see it called the Community Combo. It's 100% financing. You need a minimum of 620 to qualify. But the way we do 120 is you do 80% on the first loan, 20% on the second loan, but the term is exactly the same. So whatever the rate is on the first, it's the same on the second, they're both 30 year fixed. It's just, it's a way that we're able to minimize risk while being able to deliver a product with no down payment. So your only responsibility will be the closing costs. So the only thing with this loan, it's fantastic, there's no mortgage insurance. So when I start talking about grant opportunity, this one's not gonna work because there's already two liens on the property, the first loan and the second loan. We have a conventional 3% down loan with no mortgage insurance. So we call it home, we actually have two of them. So if you wanna make an offer on a property, we offer two conventional loans. They have different qualifiers. But what you're looking for is when you make an offer on a property, if you make a conventional offer, you have a better chance of getting that offer accepted over FHA. FHA is a good loan, and when it's needed, it's there to deliver. The only thing about an FHA loan is you gotta think about the seller in the transaction. You're making an offer, and your financing is fine, but the seller has to look at it and say, listen, if I take this person's FHA offer, guess what comes with it? You have to look at the house now and say, I might have to do work for FHA to approve this transaction. If the walls have chipping paint, gotta paint them. If there's no railings going down the steps, simple fix, but it has to be done beforehand. If there's cracks on the sidewalk or the steps, they gotta be fixed. And everybody knows people are lazy, nobody wants to do more work than they have to. So if there's a conventional offer and an FHA offer, they're gonna go with the conventional. Now that doesn't mean your offer could be stronger in other aspects, so it doesn't mean you're not gonna get your offer accepted. But if and when possible, you wanna to try to find a way to go on the conventional side. FHA. Phenomenal program overall, 3.5% down. So some people say FHA is a lower down payment, but if you did the math, our conventional program is 3% down, FHA is 3.5% down. But why would you go FHA over conventional? Sometimes it might be because you need a higher seller's assist. That might be one reason. So what you want to know is if you apply with a lender and they put you in a program, it's okay to ask why. Or are there any other options available to me? Don't let them just put you in a box and just not know why they put you there. Because you might want to know, were you not eligible for the other product or not? Another way to close the gap on, close, uh, on down payment and closing costs. Closing costs specifically, you can do a seller's assist. A seller's assist is if it's part of the plan, you can ask the seller to give you a credit to help you cover some of the closing costs. The average closing cost in Philadelphia specifically is about 6%. So if you're able to get a 6% seller's assist, then what's happening is, Whatever offer you're making them, the seller is paying you out of his proceeds or her proceeds. So not everybody wants to do it. Now if you catch a good situation and the seller is, I don't want to say desperate, willing to work with you, seller's assist might be a good way to bridge that gap and say, like, listen, for this deal to go, here's our offer. You might offer a little bit more money, but the seller's assist can help bridge that gap because the way I always like to explain it to people, when you purchase a home, Look at the cash to close of the bucket, not. Hello? Okay. Look at it as a bucket. Because some people say, like, well, is it down payment? Is it closing costs? You're going to be responsible for a certain amount of cash to close.
So just to use an even number, because my math is terrible, if you buy a $100,000 house, 3% down is $3,000. 6% for transfer tax, closing costs, title fees, escrows, is another six. So you would need $9,000 on a conventional deal. So now let's work backwards. Where is that $9,000 going to come from? It can come from your savings. It can come from your 401k. It can come from a gift if you want to do it from a family member. If it comes as a gift, it has to be paper trail. FHA requires a bank statement. A conventional loan only requires a copy of the canceled check. Why that's important, you ask? Because if it's part of the plan to get a gift and you get an FHA mortgage, some people might be happy to help you with the money, but then you ask them for a bank statement, they might not be so happy and willing to do so. And we heard stories of personal encounters um, that people get into a relationship. I had a mother get into a fight with her daughter, who was, you know, the mother was given the gift, got in a fight and was withholding the bank statement saying, I'm not giving it to you. They worked it out, but you can, you can see where I'm going with this. <laughs> if it's part of the plan, make sure they know it's gotta be a bank statement. That person cannot redact any information, it's gotta be complete. Name, address, account numbers, it can't be, well here's a snapshot, a picture. We're looking for everything to be verified. So that's why it's important to know what's the plan. So I kind of covered that quick. I'm going to do one little circle back regarding the assets. You can get a gift. Usually it has to be from a family member. You can pull from a 401k if you're eligible. You can pull from obviously checking, savings, anything. But they're looking for account activity. Meaning, what happens if you get your bank statement, you needed, we talked about it, say you need $6,000 to close. You provide a bank statement. 20 days ago, there was a $5,000 cash deposit. What happens? They want to know where it came from. You tell me how you're going to prove cash. And that's where the, the deal gets stopped. You can't prove cash. How are you going to prove cash? Now, there's very specific nuances. You have to stay away from cash deposits. Somebody also mentioned a firm. Not all of them report to the credit bureaus. So when a lender, before they see your bank statement, will say, here are your liabilities, here's what you're pre-approved for. But when you provide the bank, because you're not required to provide bank statements up front. You're not required to. If you provide your bank statements, and they start seeing certain type of activities, like in a firm, there's different, um, I don't want to say the names wrong, but every retailer has these different ones now. That could potentially count against your debt to income ratio. Because now that's a liability. You didn't report to your credit, but the underwriter will see those activities and say, well, wait a second. There's like $300 a month now this person is paying to a firm and the other names that I'm just blanking at the moment. So that's something you also want to make sure you know well, what are your liabilities that you're paying out? It does get confusing because when you're applying for a mortgage, that's the thing. But we're not looking at like child care, cable bill, gas bills. We're not factoring that into that income ratio. So knowing exactly what counts against you, that's why I'm just personally an advocate. If you weren't able to provide bank statements or wherever the money is coming from up front, let the lender review it to identify any red flags. If you have a 5,000, I'm just, by the way, this is the next part, just for information purposes. If you did do the $5,000 deposit or you're comfortable saving money at home, we can only go back two months, technically speaking. So when you apply for your mortgage, whatever that date is, if you sign the contract today, we're in January, you need November, December's bank statement, right? So let's just say in December, you deposit $5,000. Normally the plan would be, well, if you wait a month or two, we won't see that activity anymore. So now that money becomes, and this is the magic word, season. So it's been in the account for two months, we don't see that activity anymore. Again, that's all part of the plan. Because the problem is some people do feel comfortable saving at home. We, banks obviously need to feel comfortable and safe to deposit money in the bank. Not everybody likes to do that. But again, if it's part of the plan, then you just have to have a little bit of a waiting period to deposit. Honestly, as a loan officer, it's what you prove. 620. So Fannie and Freddie, it's 620, period. Like that's their rule. FHA has their rule. Different lenders, banks, brokers, etc. they have what they want. They're overlays, it's called an overlay. So like if, I, if FHA goes to 580 and, F, and Fulton Bank goes to 620, 
That's Fulton Bank's decision. That means you can go to another lender that can go below. Some people have actually a higher overload conventional. They want you want to be at a 640. So that's why also, by the way, one thing I will recommend, we talked about hard inquiries on credit. I advise everybody, if you're gonna apply for a mortgage, shop around. In the 30 day window, I think it's 40, but let's say 30 day window, if multiple lenders pull your credit, it counts as one hit. Don't get discouraged from applying in multiple places. You'd be surprised how much beneficial that can be. And you never deposit it? I would start depositing. If you're, if you're self-employed, there's nothing wrong with getting paid cash, but if you're gonna go to an institution and ask for money, it's all about paper trail. And always, and the one thing I just want everybody to have in the back of their mind, nobody thinks about it from the lender side of what's the worst case scenario. If your loan gets foreclosed on, or if you start missing payments, what you don't see that happens behind the scenes is that file will get audited, and they're gonna say, why did you think that this person was in a good position to repay this loan? Whether it be your savings, whether it be your work history, whether it be how do we calculate the income? And we have to justify, we can't say the person had no money, and then let's say you fall short or something happens, can't do that. You changed the job recently, it's hourly, it's fluctuating, and we try to give a higher level of qualified income, and then God forbid the hours get cut back, for whatever reason, house gets foreclosed on, why did you think this was a good idea? Which is why the lend, we're a lending institution, the people that make the rules, you'll hear these names a lot, Fannie, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, they make the guidelines. We just follow the guideline to lend. So sometimes banks are more conservative, some banks are less conservative, but there is a line that's required from everybody. As an asset, absolutely. Because you use the magic word. It's check, it's traceable. But not every program requires a rental history. If it does, if it's something you're relying on, like FHA will tell you sometimes it does or doesn't, um, that's where you have to have these things because then it will, it will show like a gap. But that's not as tightly mind. Yeah. But chances are, where do you pull it? it, it and again, like sometimes you have to get a little bit creative. If you, if, I'm not saying I'm not asking what you did or didn't do, but if you weren't able to get a money order, if you pull, say it's $500 rent every single month, and we see an ATM withdraw for $500 that month that you weren't able to get the money order, we can use a little bit of common sense. Or if somebody has a perpetual, uh, remember I told you not everybody likes to keep money in the bank, it's fine. So if every time, every month you see these withdrawals, we can kind of make a case, and again, case by case, but we can kind of make a case like, listen, this person just prefers to withdraw cash and keep cash. So you kind of show like it's part of your thing. But if you, for the last couple of months, never withdraw at an ATM, and then all of a sudden you're like, I'm sitting on 10,000 at home, it's a problem. Well, um, I want to know, if you have a PR rent job, I'm thinking I'm working at least two years. Oh, what's your what? name? PR rent. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, you've been working at least two years. With that calendar, does it have to be part time? What kind of income? So I thought you said RM like a nurse? No, PRM. Like I said, PRM versus part-time. Well, per diem. Per diem. Per diem. Per diem. Um, per diem, you need a two-year history. So per diem, anything that's variable, you need a two-year history. If, if you look at your paycheck and you get paid differently every single time, whether it's up or down or whatever, anything that creates a variable other than a salary, Self-employed, per diem, especially, by the way, this happened a lot with nurses. Nurses that went from W-2 to 1099 because they started making a ton more money, but they had to wait until they filed their taxes because per diem or um, when they went self-employed, you need now at least one year history to show how much are you gonna show that you've been earning that way. The per diem is as needed, so how can a bank tell you this is how much this person makes without seeing the history of it? That makes sense? And that, fall, that goes for any income that you're using. There has to be a history and a pattern, okay? That's why employment history is very important in this equation. And if you miss one piece of that puzzle, it's detrimental. And most lenders, when deals fall apart, you hear these horror stories, the lender just didn't do the job, the due diligence up front. 
it really does come down, and I want to say one thing about like my position itself. The loan officer, the person that is forward facing to you, there's a lot of responsibility on that person to make sure they get the information correct. Deals fall apart if my job is not done correctly, you end up paying that price. And you'll hear, and I got stories galore if you guys want to hear it in the hallway, um, of deals that fall apart at the end, or if I came in to rescue a deal, because the loan officer, I don't want to put a reputation on the bank, the loan officer did not do their job properly. They didn't document it right, they didn't explain to the underwriter correctly. The underwriter in the equation will never talk to you. They will never email you, they'll never text you. The communication flows through your LO. If the loan officer doesn't communicate to the underwriter the questions properly, if they don't give them the answers properly, if I don't defend why I'm calculating the way I'm calculating it, because some loan officers are not skilled, there are more bad loan officers than good in terms of education-wise and skill in the product, that's how deals get blown up. This market, you'll hear inventory is low. Everybody heard that? Rates are high. Everybody heard that? Well, what happens if those two magic things happen? Volume drops. What loan officers started doing is they're dabbling now in a market they never dabbled in before because when volume was around, nobody wants to deal with the first time home buyer. And nobody wants to deal with grants. Why? They're complicated. So if you're a loan officer that's used to simple, easy, somebody that's been at their job for 20 years and enough money in the bank to buy the house two and a half times over, there's no moving parts. You start explaining to a loan officer that's never done a first time home buyer, what do you mean you only have 3,000 saved? You want to buy a house? You have 1,000 saved? Now, I've had transactions where the borrower's total investment was 1,000 or less, but again, all the pieces have to fall in place. But the different loan officer could also be a Fulton Bank. I'm not saying Fulton's exclusive. It could also be a Fulton Bank. That's why you want to interview the loan officer and get as much information as you can, and you definitely want to shop around. I want everybody's business, but I promise you, you want to shop around to make sure. It's the biggest purchase. Everybody's got different things. Last 10 minutes, I'm going to dedicate to grants, but I'm going to take two more questions. That's a good question. That was not scripted, I promise you that. How do you interview with a loan officer? Number one question people always ask, and I don't blame anybody for doing it, number one and usually the only one, what are the rates? I get a phone call, people ask me, no question, what's your rate for? What's your rate for? I mean, listen, there's a rate sheet, there's multiple pages, there's multiple programs, there's multiple factors, there's a matrix of where you fall. How do you answer that question? Also, what if I told you my rate's lower, but it's gonna cost you more money to get it? So knowing the questions to ask is, one, what programs do you have? What grant opportunities do you present? What do you, can you do manual underwriting, which gets a little bit more advanced? But you also wanna see like, how much information are they willing to give you? If they tell you, after any question you ask, I need to put your credit first. Listen, if you ask me how much we charge to do a loan, by law, it's the same for everybody. Whether you have 800 credit or 600, our fees, our bank fees are the same. I don't need to put your credit to tell you our bank fee. The rate, different. The bank fees are standard. So anybody remember the 2008 meltdown? If you ever heard the word dot franc? They made it so that it's the same for everybody. Can you imagine charging if the, again, your rate, different. But the fees, when you look at overall fees, they're the same. I want to cover the grants because listen, there's an abundant amount of grant opportunity. If you look at a purchase your first home, and almost all of the grants require you to be a first time home buyer or not have owned a home for at least three years. That's also considered a first time home buyer. Philadelphia has the Philly First Home Grant, it's 6% up to $10,000. Mm. Okay? The thing is, you have to complete the counseling first. Almost everything I'm going to tell you now, most of them require you to complete the housing counseling first and get your housing certificate. But that's $10,000, 6%, up to $10,000. That could bridge the gap when you need it for down payment and closing costs, right? March, I think in March, first front door is gonna open back up. First front door used to be, used to be a five, that far away, used to be a $5,000 grant. In March, I believe March 15th, don't quote me, it's going to 15,000. That grant, again, first time home buyer, there's always income restrictions. But that 15000 could also help bridge the gap for down payment and closing costs. Do you have a question? I have a question. Are you considered a first-time home buyer if you inherited your home, but the loan is in your name now? And the loan is in your name? 
the loan was placed in your name. I don't want to speak on behalf of the grants, but that's, it's a little specific. One thing I, I do know, if you inherited a property that you don't live in, you just happen to be the person that inherited the property, there's a case they made. But if you live in the property and you're on the deed of the property, how you acquire the property, they might not consider you a first time Because the, the magic word there is not in your name. There's nothing to look up a lien search though, like this person owns a property. Because on the back end, when we're talking about technology, you may think the lender's asking you questions. We already know what it is. <laughs> we're just asking for the explanation. We know if you own houses, we know all the debt, we know all the employment, we can pull transcripts. It's really, we're asking for an explanation. It's not really like, do you have any other homes? Up front, maybe. But if you lie or you don't disclose everything, the lender will find out, it's just how much time and money do you want to lose until you find out. That's the... Um, I have a question about, uh, for a person that is using uh, the VA loan. Mm -hmm. um, when using it, uh, the grants that you did talk about, does, are you able to apply for those grants as well? Most of them, yeah. <laughs> first front door, Philly first home, PHFA has a VA option as well. VA, just so everybody knows, if you're a military veteran, or spouse of a military veteran, you can get 100% financing, no mortgage insurance. You just need the eligibility form. It's a phenomenal problem. Here's a question back here. <laughs> yes, condos considered a home. Some grant programs have a restriction to condos. Because the condo is considered a higher risk. Because keep in mind, when you're getting a grant, certain grants, keep it's a lien against your property. If you're thinking about your property, that's the that final factor when you get those grants. So it's additional responsibility, which is why the housing council is so important. Because if you're only putting down 3% and they get all these grants where you're in the house for $1,000, that's not a lot of skin in the game. You want to make sure that you know what you're getting into as well. Just one more question. Hi, this question is in regard to the loans. So I heard you talking about a spouse of the What about a child of the day? Would a child of the day have the same amount that it would have? Another one. I might be wrong, but not that I'm aware. It, it gets really specific. Like that, yeah. but it's like a spouse, but it's also got to be like a spouse. If it's a widow and you're not remarried, like it gets really specific. Let's give it up for Jeff.